So this is our fifth chat <coughs> after uh, four chats covering hegemony and social strategy by Lachlan Mouf. Um, this isn't necessarily about a book, but uh, we will be drawing from that book as well as Capitalist Realism by Mark Fisher. And I don't know, well, not perhaps not in this either half of the chat or if we split the chat up into two, not in this chat at all. Um, we won't be mentioning Doug Lane's video. Fuck. Is postmodernism conservative? Is that the mm-hmm. title of the video? Yeah. Um, da, 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 but we may. It may come up. But they're the three sources that we're drawing from um, for this or this two-part series. But it's not just a two-part series because in either this video or these next two videos, we're going to be um, looking at what a populist movement looks like or what constitutes a populist movement or who constitutes a populist movement um, by examining um, first hegemony and then the, um, the, the, the concept of universal, the universal subject. Um, after that, we'll be looking at populism per se. So that'll be more not who, who constitutes a populist movement and what it looks like, but more um, how to attain one. Um, Mm -hmm. And then after that, we'll eventually get to what a populist movement can do by examining the the frontiers, um, the sort of social frontiers in terms of like social relations or like our, our relationship between ourselves, our relationship between commodities, our relationship between material objects, our relationship between the environment, stuff like that. And um, how Marx outlined or identified what, how they changed in the transition between feudalism and capitalism. And then not only how those changes might look today in a shift or a transition between capitalism and post-capitalism or socialism, but also what those frontiers look like today and what movements um, are active on those frontiers and can they be reconciled within a populist movement and what sort of things need to happen to, to sort of to bring that together. Uh, but for now, it is the hegemony of capitalist realism. And um, I, think, I think this discussion is going to cover pretty much just the links between um, hegemony and social strategy and capitalist realism in terms of in terms of the ideology, in terms of neoliberalism as an ideology, as, as a, hege- a hegemon, and what it has done and how it affects that status, or what it, what it has done to affect that status and what it, like, what it does what it has done since it became that status, if that makes sense. And, um, and what sort of, what both sets of authors or what both books sort of outline as uh, what needs to happen to sort of get past this um, and why it's important actually to acknowledge that it is a hegemonic situation because the reason that's important is because that the left over the last quarter of a century or so has vacated the area that was once occupied by the traditional left um, and moved towards the center. And um, this move sort of has lent to the idea that it is not a hegemonic scenario, that it is a natural, pragmatic um, situation that we all need to accept, which has spilled over into the continual rise of the right since the 90s uh, to current day. We've, we've the UK has just left the EU on a on a far right populist um, campaign, pretty much. Um, not not necessarily whether staying or leaving the EU is left or right, but just that was what activated the the far right was what activated that outcome. And um, and yeah, that's that's what we're going to talk about today. Let me take a breath. Do you edit these bits out? <laughs> so as well as Ollie <clears throat> and myself, we've got Chewbacca's beard. 
Dr. Dr. Hughes. Um, I forget your, your I'm here to haunt your full title. Don't I'm do interested it. in hauntology. We're adding that bit there. <laughs> um it's an actual Deridian thing. Mm. On top. Yeah. But me and I also don't... go on. I was just going to say, there's also a uh, Ghost of My Life by Mark Fisher is a study of hauntology. Oh, oh, there we go. Gosh. Well, are you... I'm not are you... actually... It's not related. I, was I, just gonna... I don't think... Yeah, I was just going to ask. Um, I don't think your... it's not necessarily related. Don't get your hopes up. Um... So well, will I just will I will I like kick off with the with the chat sheet and and see where it goes? I think so. I think so. Yeah. You yeah. got any words of wisdom? Right now? Yeah. No. Okay then. <laughs> so I mean, what? Yeah, basically, it kicks off from from where we were, from where I was, what I was just saying about neoliberalism and capitalist realism, uh, the links between. Then, how if neoliberalism was um, a, 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 like a, to bring it back to it, it as a burgeoning um, political articulation? Um, I think we touched on this in the last video. Like bef- before that point, it was something that occurred or that that was sort of born a hundred years ago in actually. <laughs> This, here's this country thing again, uh, Switzerland, uh, in Geneva, maybe. Mm. Um, and um, the group of men talking about their ideas, hashing it out, getting a getting a sort of a framework and a, a map work for neoliberalism on paper, and then spending decades and God knows how much money developing an infrastructure, uh, which sort of laid out a pathway to um Thatcher and Reagan and you know they didn't they didn't just sort of come and institute their politics they 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 identified their enemy their the thing they wanted to kick back against and from that point from that counterpoint they sort of started attempting to appeal to people's dissatisfaction uh, and grievances and articulating the solution in a specific way and um, eroding the common sense that I suppose, I mean, I'm sure it could be defined in a number of ways, but just one way for ease is like a, in social democracy, a common sense of solidarity, like people accepting of the welfare state um, and, and, and pinning a high value on that. And, when they came along, they began a process, a cultural process of eroding that common sense and instituting another one, which instead of sort of punching upwards to ensure that the large majority of the populace was taken care of by the state, uh, to start punching downwards and um, t- to breed a sense or a will for a reduced state and uh, to free the individual from having to having the burden of the state or the burden that the state was putting on them to take care of everyone else below them to free the individual from that so that they could achieve their their full potential in in um, a very particular type of liberal freedom um, and obviously that took time and effort and a hundred years later we'll, well actually a hundred years later I suppose we're, we're sort of coming out of that moment and coming out of that common sense and we're seeing new common senses and new cultural uh, programs to attempt to reinstitute a, a, a different type or a different form of common sense. But in the last um, 30 years, that being the neoliberal period with this common sense fully instituted. And obviously it's, it still comes to bear. People are still not entirely accepting of the, uh, of the welfare state, um, we're far away from a, a general state of um, solidarity, social solidarity. Uh, particularly now, it's sort of intensifying, I guess, um, with with anti-immigration and anti-Islam movements. Um, 
and and there's a chance that that could be the next sort of paradigm which is terrifying um because once that once once sort of once the totality that neoliberalism presented successfully for itself is peeled away at the edges um the the next the next blanket the next sort of apparent totality that could be instituted is 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 a disgusting and horrible anti anti sort of marginal um situation and i suppose i mean that's 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 i mean it used to be sort of 10 years ago what we would want to sort of kick back against was um was neoliberalism but right now it's the it's the 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 sort of flashpoint or the possibility of the opportunity of the peeling away of neoliberalism um being articulated by the far right um is our sort of imminent target and the point of these chats uh, to try to figure out how to insert ourselves in a process that um that sort of um helps make sure that that doesn't happen and not by voting in hillary clinton or Keir Starmer. um so yeah i mean that's 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 neoliberalism and i think i think the sort of the focus that capitalist realism puts on neoliberalism um is to sort of frame it in in those terms of 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 how of how it manages to sort of conceal the externalities that it incorporates so by that i mean as as like as a as a powerful hegemonic um situation is like i said a minute ago it sort of attempts to uh it attempts to represent itself as a totality the totality of society but because <clears throat> that's ridiculous um within within its rep- discursive representation um there are things that aren't it it there are, there are antagonisms and there are disagreements and there are things that are just not neoliberal and they're the sort they're the its externalities within its social community or political community and um and the the, the power of its hegemonic practice is to conceal those differences to conceal that externality or those externalities of course and um and carry on sort of regardless to to to, to somehow convey to its legitimizing factors the people at large um that it, it, it that it is actually legitimate and it was so successful it managed to um do that to the point where the left like i said already vacated the left became centrist um and signaling to everyone that there was no other way this the third way was the way forward pragmatism um post political um mm. a politics without frontiers and reading black lion Moof, um and they've got they do quite a bit on like um group psychology and freud and all that and the 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 what is it the the thing the sort of the thing that brings people together the is is the libidinal libidinal drive and um love and um but sort of as a as the the sort of constituting um the the other side to that is is hate and social division and um they Basically, I, I, like I'm, I'm still missing like a few of the links. I'm still not there yet, but they use that as a foundation to argue that um, that you can't basically you can't take the political away from people. You can't suppress the urge to um, express social divisions. So, as soon as the left vacated the left and declared the end of a left-right dichotomy um, and instituted a political without frontiers um you you they robbed 
the political uh, institutions and um, robbed people of that impulse, that, that avenue to to express that impulse, um, mm-hmm. leading to so you know because it wasn't because the common sense that existed, um, there was very little public space for that expression. So it wasn't as if people were like, oh, God, I, I can't vote for the left or I can't vote for the far right. I've got to vote for this thing. And that's ridiculous. And, hmm. you know, there wasn't there wasn't like a palpable conversation in the street. I mean, there was particularly around like in Ireland when in 2007 with the Lisbon Treaty, like there is moments. But by and large, that conversation really wasn't taking place and people didn't feel I I. I mean, because of the community that we were in, we were comfortable enough expressing those urges and bringing up that. But I, I don't feel that without that community, if if I was on my own, sort of like away from that community now that I am, but back 10, 15 years ago, I wouldn't have felt comfortable sort of bringing up that issue because the social space, you know, out in the public was sort of like, oh, don't rock the boat sort of thing. And sure, sure. And I think that um, that led to that suppression. Oh. And when you, obviously when you suppress something, you're like, you're adding a, you're adding a pressure to it and it builds up and sort of, it sort of, it causes ruptures elsewhere, mm-hmm. which, which sort of has come to, um, come to a bit of a, it's managed uh, like enough ruptures in the last, um, say five years enough ruptures have sort of um, taken place that they've they've managed to identify they've managed to like oh like you know they can see across you can see across in america we can see across in england ireland whatever in france and you, oh yeah something's happening here so that they start to identify with something other than their grievance mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so so that suppressed feeling um amounts to to an eventual momentary rupture but that those ruptures are happening at such a frequency they're attempting to identify or they're beginning to identify with each other and um and that's the sort of moment when the that neoliberal representing its neoliberalism representing itself as a a totality without externalities um peels away the 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 representation sort of crumbles and Mm -hmm. um, we're getting uh we're getting something else Mm -hmm. no i mean definitely uh, i can definitely associate with uh your points about you know had we not had that that particular those particular social circles or that particular sort of i guess i don't know positive incubation that we we had for being able to express ideas and being able to act and organize in in quite radical ways as opposed to say where i would have come from before which again would have been that exact description was yeah don't rock the boat because and i think this is what um was quite astounding for me reading fisher's book um in the beginning was because um obviously being aware of you know going up through you know with what what we were doing in ireland and and how uh, what 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 that was all about, the conversations we were having and the ideas I was getting to hear, uh, mm-hmm. slowly transferring into obviously then meeting slightly more radical groups and group and here starting to hear bits about anarchism and and socialism from uh, more organized groups in town that were doing bigger things and moving out of Ireland uh, and actually traveling to to suddenly be surrounded by even larger groups of people. Yeah. Um, this. This was something that, uh, you know, if I consider what I read in Fisher's book, especially, you know, when he's basically breaking down, like re, or at least shining some light on how you, one could, I suppose, re-inject politics into these various aspects of, of society, of organized society that we have now, or at least this is my reading of it. Um, the place that I came from pre starting to have these conversations, uh, you know, yeah, you 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 didn't rock the boat. Um, there was no alternative, yeah. um, and I think that that was what gave me quite a fright reading into this because you know it had been uh, I hadn't read anything as, <coughs> as I, I think blunt and as quick <laughs> to read as as capitalist realism um, was considering my growing up and thinking just how institutionalized this had been that it hadn't even been something that had occurred to me. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, as part of that, 
part of that sort of that age bracket will have just continued on with that. It's not an even case of we had known anything different, uh, except I being part of that group, we had had, you know, starting to get be surrounded by some of these more radical um, left wing sort of ideas. Um, had I not had that, I would have just carried on this this entrenched there is no alternative probably into my into my later years i even i even think that the things that we were doing was was like as you say like without knowing anything else <laughs> like a d- direct um reaction like i wonder if if we were born 20 years before we had been um under all equal circumstances um would we have been like mad um <laughs> like quasi-parliamentarian communists because we're coming of age at a time when this apoliticism was it's tour de force like um and uh as dissidents as burgeoning dissidents of it um we attached ourselves to an apolitical um ideology that said no 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 there's no hope of gaining any ground through uh, parliamentary politics let's just demand its total eradication uh, regardless of what everyone else thinks and um but yeah so i wonder like was neoliberalism so powerful that it dictated to us our our avenue for um dissent in in such a to such an extreme that it was rendered useless which is actually i think touched on in the the next um either next half of this chat or the next chat um uh when they're talking about the the postmodern um movements and resistance uh instead of resistance and reaction instead of um something sort of more profound and um radical i mean in some ways um neoliberalism has been pretty comfortable with the you know anti-capitalist movements of the late 90s and kind of early to mid 2000s and since i think the occupy movement in response to the financial crash in the west um that kind of dissent has been pretty much commodified really Mm. um in that it's become part of kind of mainstream media narratives you know late night talk shows uh, Hollywood movies, that kind of narrative of being, you know, anti-establishment to such a degree that you can even talk about uh, diverse types of sexuality, um, problems with capitalism. 11,000 spices and no chicken. Yeah. Uh, um, the fact that all of the things that we would have been talking about, like even just abortion, feminism, that were completely, you know, radical uh, in the early mid 2000s are now part of absolute mainstream discourse and yet the stakes politically are you know more grave than they even were back then absolutely mm. jesus the um is leo fradker was is he austerity was an austerity government but he's certainly pro that now i mean his response to the housing crisis is you know just get the businesses building more houses. So that's that. I mean, that says it all. Like the, the amazing sort of social advances that Ireland has made under Leo Varadkar, mm-hmm. but in terms of sort of extricating ourselves from from the the democratic onslaught that that politics represents is just how how yeah. limited. And I think it's interesting you were saying kind of the uh, the alternative that was available to us in at you know that time 20 years ago was <laughs> was <laughs> you know democratic politics is not working um and it's and i remember arguing with you at the time that that was too extreme um a position but like look now i mean we have the same problems we've got growing inequality but now we have a burning planet but uh so that i think i sent you the other day i don't know if i sent it to you ollie but the um oh i can't remember the it might have even been the government uk government research but um i don't think it was i can't remember but uh democracy um 
in popular opinion was at an all time low in terms of sort of like uh, its capacity to deal with the big, the burning questions mm-hmm. um, facing us. And, and like just what you said in terms of our argument back then, democracy. So like the amazing thing about these books or particularly um, Black Lion Move is that, you know, this, it isn't, it isn't democracy. That's the issue here. It's, it's the, um, I don't know. I'm sure I've said this in one of the other in the other chats, but like the the sort of the, the historic um, situation where liberal elements of our of of Europe and America and democratic um, elements came together to defeat the the authoritarian elements um, and combined in a in an awkward um, what the hell's it called an awkward arrangement with one another um, in the post war period to ensure that we wouldn't have that existential threat to our society mm-hmm. rear its head again. But it, in the interim, um, that liberal element or a certain specific aspect of that liberal element. Um, and this, this is the, this is the story that I started this off with, um, you know, hegemonized its position, you know, that here you have two equal and awkward bedfellows and, slowly but surely one of them's just rolling over in the bed and taking up more space to the point where like they go full scale attack on their bedfellow starting with Thatcher and Reagan and increasing continuously whether left or right governments were in place and um you know that it was it wasn't democracy or lack of democracy or not lack of democracy but it wasn't democracy that was the problem it isn't democracy that's the problem now it's the lack of democracy that we don't or people that by and large don't realize has taken place um through an overdetermination of liberalism in that in that arrangement um and i think particularly um particularly in the 80s when uh, hegemony and social strategy was written um or published oh, it was 85 um they even though they were talking about sort of the lack of democracy that's inherent in marxism um they were pointing this out or starting to point this out that um that you don't need to get rid of liberal democracy you just need to um ensure that um a hegemonic project or or, or You just need to acknowledge that it is a hegemonic project, and and that if you, they frame it in terms of um, the values in a liberal democracy is liberty and equality, the two conflicting factors, and ev- everything in terms of probably what the majority of people in Europe and America believe in, everything can be determined in terms of a ratio between those two things, so the politics that needs to happen, which hasn't happened because of, a, of an incredibly powerful hegemonic situation from through neoliberalism, all that needs to happen is that contingency of power needs to be recognized. And then depending on what you value, and if you need to recognize that, then you obviously value the other, uh, you politically get behind that other thing and redefine publicly um, its benefits. But not in like not in, not in a rational way. They emphasise the fact that this is an emotional, um, affective register, like that. Uh, people, I mean, this goes back to Freud again. People are um, people are looking to express a, a social division. But, and, but I think one of the problems that Whitmuth and Laclau's conception of the public is they can tend to be quite homogenising, um, particularly when they talk about subjectification. Um, and they themselves talk about the problem of representation. So, like Ollie was saying, it's capitalism's job to create a sense of totality um, that can paper over the differences between different political positions, and paper over the contributions in um, capitalism, inequality, that type of thing, the contradictions uh, within liberal democracy, like the fact that there's, again, inequality. But at the same time, you know, everyone's free and everyone can be a millionaire and all that type of thing. So it's it's capitalist realism's job to try and, you know, create a sense of a narrative that we can all live by to continue propping up that structure. Um, but the problem I think that has been faced 
by new forms of mediation like social media and the kind of fragmentation of the creation of content it's no longer coming from those you know Grand the, 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 generators. the huge the hollywood the you know <coughs> state tv um the kind of you know few content creators now people themselves are creating the content and you're getting a much greater diversity of messages and narratives that are in you know continual uh conflict and there's no way of resolving them um and i don't know can uh particularly Muth's idea of the um left populism when she talks about diversity she she's kind of talking about the intersection of inequalities again across like race class sexuality gender but are the narratives that people are looking to on facebook that are so fragmented um you know is it possible to tie them together in like some type of kind of aesthetic of solidarity that people can actually get behind in large enough clumps to make a difference hmm. i think i think the two things with that is that um her starting point i mean this this might not like have direct whopping impact on on your point but but just in terms of like um, going forward with discussing the point, the, the starting point or the unitary point for her is the is not the individual, but but, but the sub individual, and that's that's the, the the emotions and the, the 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 passions and the demands that people might have. Um, oh, the second point then was to discuss the possibility of what of basically what you just said there, um, and I think like we've seen that like make america great again has done that mm. in in these times mm -hmm. um it's so i think what was it there, there's there's it was put really well um in lacklaus i think back of the book um that bread land and peace where the with the russian revolutions mm -hmm. make america great again and it wasn't like most of the social movements at that time uh, in russia uh, didn't necessarily want that but they became the the, the catch-all for any other grievances that are just attached to it in the same way somehow um uh a hegemonic project mm -hmm. um has has come to bear in in the u.s under make america Great again it's like the empty signifier it's mm -hmm. it's empty enough that it's <coughs> able to sort of it's, it's, it's just hitting it's hitting the um probably what the double void is way back then mm -hmm. it's hitting that um <laughs> sweet spot that it's vague enough to bring people in but it's certain enough that it just doesn't let people up doesn't let people um fade away again or back into the ether mm -hmm. um sure sure they absolutely know they align with whatever it is that means but again it can mean something for a group of people something completely different for another but because you've got and especially because you've got this one central voice i guess telling you, look, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. And that continuous mantra of we're going to make America great again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever Managed you've got in your head, it's just, it's yeah, there. It's, it's, it's a, a loop. But, um, but kind of like, it, like if you imagine like a tape without its eraser heads, the way that when a tape records it, it erases as it goes through. If you take those eraser heads out, you just have a continuous, continuous. loop that will continuously record. And I don't know. I see America great again as like a sort of mantric loop. It's just, it keeps taking whatever it needs to and then just runs that through for a while. And then whatever anyone else is sort of needing or a grievance, they can sort of throw that into the tape and it just plays that back to them as well. Yeah. And that's like all of the worst parts of postmodern aesthetics, isn't it? It's the, it's the superficiality at the, yeah, it's, it's all sizzle and no steak. It's the, it's the, <laughs> it's the superficial, but without like, there's, there is no genuine political economy beneath that. Like you look at Trump's policies and they're completely and utterly like, they're so populist that they're literally changing from quarter to quarter. Like his, like the, you know, like liberalism, um, and, like that's backed up by you know an entire political economy uh in the 18th and 19th century backed up by an industry a scientific project you know like whole large cultural movements uh are supporting these um these ideals and you know that's where they get their stability and their solidity from and they 
the power uh, of, of, of their hegemonic force comes from this. But with the likes of Make America Great Again, it's clearly not sustainable. It's you- like, it's a complete floating signifier. It's empty. It's it's talking about something vague that can be a million different things. And it is a million different things as a result of that. And America is more divided, not any more united after America's uh, make America great again. And so I would worry about, you know, how do you get the balance of, okay, so we can come up with some sort of floating signifier, like make America great again, but how can you give that some sort of um, uh, like political economic thrust that can actually deal with things like inequality, deal with climate change, gather people together and, you know, produce some sort of vision or imagine, imagination of the future that we can build. I, so are you, I mean, you definitely are, but it took me, as you were speaking, mm-hmm. the realization, like the, my initial question was, are you correlating the, um, his lack of um, solid policy suite uh, with with his ability to create that populist movement because i mean like because i would have just assumed that those were two separate things that he just it, that it suit so he he was able to assemble the 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 populist movement but also he has a vague policy suite in order to be the sort of adaptive to whatever's happening and it's it, it's a part of an, a different strategy a different level of strategy but it's interesting that that actually yeah maybe his capacity to bring together that populist movement actually is sort of rested on the, that lack of um yeah strong sort of policy line um grass more grassroots um action would would be my sort of like, like um bringing together like i was talking to my mom and maybe this shouldn't go out but i was talking to my mom about um like her, her sort of experience in the council. And she's just saying that departments inside a local county council are only beginning to realize the benefits of working together through communication. Well, not surprising. That blows my mind. I'm just so, from hearing your mom talk about it, <laughs> and anyone who works in public service, that it's, it's so poorly organized. The, uh, like my experience in the third sector is like, you get to go to conferences um, and you've got, you've got a bit of an agenda and you obviously are at least loosely in terms of your agenda, loosely sort of affiliated with the people that are in the conference and you get into a chat at the water cooler and you um, more often than not, your agenda spark like fits dovetails with the other person's agenda. You're offering something that that person's missing and all of a sudden an amazing an exciting partnership happens and like th- that happens a lot in the third sector i find uh, like there's no money to actually ever back these things up but mm. the um the hubbub the the excitement the projects and innovations they they seem pretty like constantly flowing as long as there are people getting enough money to actually be there and have a job and um, that happens and that sort of i guess that's what i mean by the the grassroots thing um if excuse me, if we're able to sort of identify the, and of course this can only ever be like unidirectionally, because I mean, it just starts personally, how could it not? Um, but if you yourself identify the, and this is what I suppose what we're trying to do here, the the sort of the range of what you consider ought to be an ultimate community. Um, and that's what we're getting, we're working towards mm-hmm. the universal subject, uh, what mm-hmm. that, should look like uh could look like and should not look like um you're you're, you're building that through just those discussions um breaking down the the barriers between um environmental activists um human rights activists um gender activists lgbtq everything just through mm. conversations and articulating a politics that's punching upwards rather than one that's punching downwards and even i mean so what the one percent sort of failed as an empty signifier but um you know maybe maybe that was too specific but at the same time i don't know i still have faith and and maybe i'll be proven wrong and but i still have faith that 
there is enough upwards and and not in terms of and mark fisher goes into this not in terms of there being a person there being a gender there being a a face to this thing that we need to punch upwards to but but the actual systemic ideological political um infrastructure that exists Uh um Uh that that can be identified as something that does so a common thread um to all those involved like Greta Thunberg doesn't doesn't seem I haven't seen enough of her but doesn't seem to sort of identify um a like a like a traditional uh left wing um antagonism but it's insinuated when and maybe this is a stretch but it's insinuated when she goes to politicians you're not doing anything nothing's changed you're not doing enough uh, for me my interpretation there is that due to the market logic nothing can be done and this is sort of what she's identifying with and so it's just so that might not be something that say climate activists would have said but it's mm. a matter of being in the right time the right place and articulating that and and joining those making those links that way huh. Yeah, I mean, I see it uh, actually more. The more I uh, investigated here, uh, the more I find of it, which was which is quite interesting. Is um, there's quite a uh, progressive trend at the moment here. I don't know if it's all of Spain, but I know. I mean, I know it's. I'm definitely starting to see it here. The feminazi buses. No, no, not the feminazi buses. Uh, Actually, the opposite. Um, Cooperative spaces that are starting to come together now, but actually in a more um, uh, centered part of town way. Uh, These aren't just like squatted spaces on the in the suburbs that are being utilized for, um, you know, obviously all good things like rape crisis centers or centers centered around uh, various progressive politics. Um, They're communal. cooperative cooperative spaces that are transcending now Mm. one particular message and more so working as say educational spaces or social spaces for people of all ages races um various backgrounds and trying to create a more general more inclusive sort of coming together of these kind of communities but now you're seeing it starting to take root in the centers of town where um cooperative based supermarkets for example are starting to spring up in uh neighborhoods um for example poorer neighborhoods where people are starting to volunteer and come into these spaces uh volunteer to work and keep these things flourished like say a couple of hours a day or a couple of hours a week even um and it's and that's working its way back out it's no longer just centralized around say I think, you know, like um, it wouldn't be centralized around, say, one very particular strand of, say, radical left wing politics. Uh, These people are now mixing with identity groups or various political um, people with various political thoughts or different from different struggles, from different blocks of resistance um, and work together on, say, common common interests, which are things like impoverished areas with little services so how can they build and flourish something together um skill sharing that kind of thing yeah. even there's a, a free uh language school here now where for example um uh people coming in from different countries especially through Im- immigration uh they're allowing people are volunteering for uh spanish and english classes to help them integrate back into or sorry, not integrate back into, but integrate into uh, society here. Um, and it's all done on a communal basis with this idea of we're doing this for all of us rather than just under a political, a one particular political idea. Um, There's um, two things strike me there. The um, Laclau in his treatment of populism gets into the, the real nitty gritty um, of the in-between like in between the concepts. Uh, so it's not just, you know, meeting, meeting a skeleton, like he's talking about the sinews of it. And um, that, that transition from like sort of isolated or um, suburban activism towards, um, because, because I mean, when we, when you used to gig around Europe with the squats, one of the biggest things I found was how isolated it sort of was like, like the, the, the ethic of solidarity was just one of the most inspiring things ever, but the, um, the sort of defaulting on inherent power 
in keeping themselves as an isolated community um well i I thought was a bit limiting and frustrating but um Hmm. so that transition to 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 sort of increasing their visibility in the center of town and promoting um hey look at this almost having like open days or whatever by the sounds of it doors not locked come on in sort of thing yeah Um, unless you're coming in with a billy club so (laughs) wait or uh, an uzi and as well yeah in belarus um the that transition um so laclau posits the, the the chain of equivalence for for populist movements like the different um the different grievances come together and not only do they have their um their own identity uh the the grievance that they still identify with but the the one that comes to and this isn't quite the extent to what you're talking about but the transition is is a model of the same sort of thing mm-hmm. um the, the grievance that comes to become the empty signifier uh, to, to represent the entire chain um it attains a new reflect reflexive identity as as it like as the hegemon in uh-huh. in in that um in that movement and then of course all other um grievances all other subject positions within the movement not only identify with their original one but also of course identify with this um dynamic that also happens sure. so what's hap- what, what it sounds like what's happened there is like okay, that movement has evolved uh, at retaining its own identity and not necessarily becoming hegemonic and having a new identity or attaching themselves to a to a hegemonic um, um, signifier and having another identity to that, but but evolving their identity to attempt to do that. Um, yeah, go on. Yeah, no, no. I was just going to say no. I agree, and um, I was just going to, you know, I guess I think I think you've just you've said it for me because uh, initially I wanted to underline and just say, you know. Um, my experience with these spaces is obviously it's, as you said, it's not, um, they're not trying to conceive of a, you know, Hey, listen, um, you know, I get that, you know, you've got your, uh, you know, your, your struggle, but that's, that's kind of not important, you know, come over, let's all get together and do this one thing. Um, I think it is very much an, an, an all inclusive, uh, in, uh, environment there, these, these spaces are trying to create. Um, it's a, your struggle is absolutely important, but here's also, you know, a way of articulating exactly. Here's a set of for did you, you know again going back to to Fisher's book. I think one thing I then found quite quite daunting about reading it was just where some of these uh, or where I may have been affected by certain instances mentioned in the book. Uh, whether it was growing up or whether it was trans, uh, transitioning into my professional life, and these are things. Uh, or these are realizations that I feel that I can uh, relate to somebody on on a more, um, I mean, whether it's just on a you know an industrial or economic level. Uh, but this is something that can transcend, say, uh, whether or not I, I I you know felt I had uh, you know communist anarcho communist tendencies or what that we could there there is that um yeah that idea of a a common. Um, common interest, a common ground, and I think that these spaces are starting to really build on that, which is quite fast. It's and it is fascinating because I think people are also reluctant around being involved with them because uh, maybe it doesn't have that level of maybe people want in certain instances that level of um, uh, isolation that you were talking about with regards to squats, and you mean maybe it's not maybe not as uh, edgy. Yeah, 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 so yeah, to exactly. speak, it's like you're not doing it hard. Like, I mean, I'll always remember the uh, at the the G8, uh, the G8 summit in in 2005. Um, hearing that that one American Christie say to me, "If I didn't come to burn down the hotel, I came to I came for the wrong reasons," and I was like, Dumb. you know, and that was that was quite a daunting thing, especially to hear at 15. Um, <laughs> coming coming like the last. The last fucking thing I'd cared more about was skateboarding, so it was kind of kind of fucking crazy to hear that. And that for me was quite a turning point where I found myself then more involved with spreading out around the various groups that I found in the campsite rather than sticking to a very particular group wanna, of people. Want to be very be- <clears throat> possibly, yeah. So yeah, so I, and I think that there is that tendency uh, here with regards to these spaces. They're not seen as maybe. Uh, 
you know, edgy enough or taking it to the ex- the extremes. Um, but it's fascinating to see them uh, like starting to flourish and specifically completely, you know, self-sustained, self-financed. Um, mm. You also have other instances that aren't, but they are people, there are think tanks here now trying to consider of more, I guess, well, that, I mean, these are public think tanks, so to speak, not an institutionalized think tank, but they're just groups getting together as share scary, uh, share, skill sharing spaces. Share but a uh, scare, scare, um, scars guarding. Ah, I was mm. going to go there. Yeah, but, um, sorry, skill sharing spaces, but, um, you know, trying to conceive of communal projects based on those skills. It's not a come down and show everyone how to be a coder. It's come down and show everyone how can we utilize some of these skills on a more social level in yeah. a more communal based way. Um, and how can we all do it together? And I think that that's, you know, that, that for me is something that, uh, I guess, you know, some of those, in, some of those ideas we were talking about in Muff that actually stood or Muff and Laclau, this idea stood out to me, or at least that, that was, that was my take, my reading mm-hmm. into some of these ideas of, of, you know, it's not to discredit or, or put down your individual struggle. It's that it can be, it can be absolutely important, um, but also as part of these these greater underlying interests uh, that we all can conceive of. I think, though, the thing that concerns me, just kind of coming back to that point I was making earlier about particularly Muff's, um, uh, how, how she imagines the public and her vision of democracy as being essentially this kind of stable, coherent thing that isn't continuously, you know, uh, changing and context dependent. I mean, she continuously talks about democracy as being the thing that needs to be established. Um, And I don't think that she puts enough time um, to critically interrogate what that is or how that will um, change and shift depending on the publics that are involved. and when you're talking about the kind of, you know, the kind of really cool and interesting stuff that's happened, um, these are just such fine threads um, that are fragmented across, you know, the globe. And what I was saying earlier about the representation being fragmented, like representation is fragmented at the social level, but the origins of that fragmentation is very real and very centralized. So, you know, the likes of Facebook, the likes of Google, the likes of um, the Pentagon, or, you know, like you have these centers of power, um, uh, like universities, governments, these types of things. Um, And again, they have a political economy to support the fragmentation efforts that they're producing. And I worry, when I think about even grassroots social movements, like there's like these are just these like brittle, weak filaments, as from a you know conceptual <coughs> level, as laudable as they are. Like where is the weight or the impact that can bring down uh, a network of you know? billionaires who are operating at a global level, Mm -hmm. Uh, a market system, which is burning the planet that's operating at a global level, Um, military foreign policy networks operating at that global level. Like this is what we're up against. And sometimes it can feel like it's very fragmented and that all we need is a public, like, and we imagine this kind of homogenous group of like large group of people, a block of people but it's the resources and it's the production of knowledge. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that we're up against. How do we um, even fathom countering that? Well, she, she's not, um, I'm probably not going to remember all the deadly points she's made and really interesting threads that come off, but hopefully, hopefully I can, because that was really good. But like the first thing is like her, there is no public there's only fluctuating subject positions um, and both both 
Black Lion Moof and Mark Fisher. And actually when we get to Doug Lane, they're talking about um they're talking about a political subject, a political universal subject, not a not a class universal subject. Um three of them actually I realized Lane did it as well. Um but the three of them emphasized the, the political aspect of it. Um they they both Lane, I don't think Fisher mentions Habermas, but just as a kickback against the modern version of the modern view of, of a public, um Black Lemouf and Lane reject that possibility. And they all three, um, what we're drawing from today, conclude that it's um that it it's the first step is this acknowledgement of of contingency and hegemony so what happens after that i mean the, the, okay so you've got you've got a fractured um a fractured social field but that first step is just generating the awareness of capitalist realism as an ideology and hegemony and like tongue in cheek the the far right did this for us and all we have to do is take down the far right um rather than what you were talking about um and one of the important things, I mean, like that, that needs unpacking what I just said, but, but like a, a next thing that leads straight off from that anyway, is that things, the infrastructure that exists, um, while, while incredibly powerful interests are controlling and directing those resources, um, the, the seat of directing those resources is contingent. And that's the importance of, parliamentary politics until we get until we're able to get to a point where we can articulate something else uh, which actually comes back at the value in what Ollie said and again what I just said needs serious unpacking but the urban view of um, attracting a volunteer base like I think you get to a point a post parliamentary politics through subsuming um, the currently disenfranchised through voluntary infrastructure um, and inverting that relationship so that they become um, the their local their own local leadership and um, start living state like um, like state as a way of life and I, th- I mean I think that's the end game but like I just I just like fucking Jackson. Jackson fired that there with the pace, the fucking hobbit. Um, All right, sorry, I was about to ask what I was like. I which J- Jackson? I was <laughs> I just Star Wars mind that US there. U.S. president from eighteen fifty one. Ah, what's his name? Michael uh, Jackson. It's not Michael Jackson. What the fuck is his name? Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson. Yeah, nineteen fifty one. Peter Jackson. Um, but yeah, that that was that. Like, I mean, I'm not I'm not gonna unpick any of those three blocks but like if anyone wants to if any of them sort of which three blocks? interest um the middle one was contingency third one was the the voluntary base um mechanism mm-hmm. and the first one was um the, the awareness of hegemony so breaking free yeah i suppose that's probably the best point to start with is breaking free from oh. the feeling and sense of cultural stasis. Oh, and culture. I think uh, one of the big sorry, mm-hmm. one of the big changes is that um, that that fracturing is is the, the 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 result of decades of of a cultural program through neoliberalism. And I, I don't think, first of all, I think inequality has gotten so much that culture is becoming a ghetto, and it can be reappropriated by those left in it. And I think that's going to be something that changes and. And is to a point because things like um, I, I, I know you're talking about fine threads, but I think I feel that there is a growing sort of um, uh, interest in these things. Um, I suppose manifested mostly in the Sanders grassroots movement, and to an extent, um, the UK one, and oh. uh, and other movements that support sort of quasi potentially radical. Um, well, re- relatively radical uh, political parties, um, oh. but also the actual culture that people are sort of re- 
the more people are involved, and I do believe that there are more people involved than there were, um, the more it's sort of reflecting and, and building a pressure and heat. So that's four. I think. Wow. Thoughts? Um, I just, like when I read Muff, um, it's so, it's so abstract. You know, there are rarely descriptions of the world or of the suffering or of the institutions or of the material realities of the things that she's talking about. So I can't help but get that sense of a kind of abstract public that's just sitting out there waiting to be mobilized either to the left or to the right. And I guess the kind of like political approach that I tend to take more is that, you know, publics gather around issues, they, you know, emerge and dissipate, thinking of them just, you know, sitting out there objectively doesn't work because they're always involved in contexts and they're always, you know, always already there in the world in positions of ongoing relationships with lots of different things. Uh -huh. And it's hard to kind of abstract them out and be like, okay, so there are, there are all these people there, there and they all have subjectivities and they all, you know, it's like this kind of origin story of people and a politics based on that, that misses the kind of like wildly complex and very, very active world and mix of social situations and individual personalities and experiences that people are already like in the midst of. And I think people are already, you know, they're pissed off about the politicians or they're pissed off about the people that have taken their jobs or they're pissed off about, you know, the welfare cheats or they're pissed off about Donald Trump or whatever it is. People are well aware that they're not in control and that they have a very minimal sense of power and that other mm -hmm. people have the power. But I can't imagine in the West in any way there's going to be any real uh, rising up um, in or, you know, glue of solidarity that's going to bind people together. And what worries me even more is the fact that where inequality is actually the strongest in places where people uh, are struggling to eat or are struggling to, um, to live outside of like pollution and, you know, severe poverty. Um, because it was always like, you know, as soon as the bread runs out, people will take to the street. Mm -hmm. um, even in those situations, um, which is the majority of the fucking world, um, the narrative that um, they're on the path of progress seems to be just far, far stronger and more powerful. I mean, she definitely does limit her focus to Europe. She doesn't even discuss uh -huh. America. Um, like, in terms of... Uh, I'd take the start of your point to um, situate us right now in a, in a place that can't even begin to consider the end of your point. Um, only, through, only through attempting to provide a model, a working model. <laughs> <laughs> that we can put into a global international uh, institution and we can deliver to um like like i think one of the problems is that the problem is global you know yeah absolutely our ways of understanding the world are local um we can't help but understand the world locally but when you have the likes of facebook as a technology at your disposal and you're a billionaire who owns that and the knowledge producing uh, mode of the day is to understand people as data points and information. Mm -hmm. Like you cannot lose, like the game is rigged for you. You know, mm -hmm. we imagine people as being uh, agents with a certain number of choices to make. Um, there are flux of data. Uh, we control the algorithm, which is a, a, you know, commercially sensitive, privately owned thing that no one gets to know about, uh, which dictates how these people communicate with each other. I think you can offer offer people something else on that local level that does impact that. I mean, is it going to release as much dopamine? Well, it would. Yeah, absolutely. It more did. sex, more people, more interaction, mm -hmm. far mm -hmm. more dopamine. Mm -hmm. um, I should have said that the other way around. <laughs> Went straight to sex. 
Um, yeah, pe- people in interaction. Um, that I mean, like I, my interpretation of of the reasons why we're we're turning to, to this. I mean, it's definitely linked to that fracturing thing, but um, the, the more specific manifestations of the fracturing thing I see more in terms of identity in YouTube, almost if if you know what I mean. Whereas Facebook then is uh, something just that's slightly aside to that. I don't. I can't really justify that right now. But um, you're. I mean, you're on. You're on Facebook because something else isn't happening. And um, and yeah, of course, you you become addicted through those sort of biochemical releases and stuff. But I definitely think like work working in communities. <sighs> People are like people are desperate for something that, that whether they're consciously aware of of a need for something else, it's there. And like when you put on like a really successful day, family day, like the the sort of the gratitude is is overwhelming and and long lasting. And the sort of the trust and relationships that 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 can be built through that. I guess is piecemeal stuff and the finest mm. of all threads, but it's evidence that something else can be offered to people and mm-hmm. um, mm. that can take them away from that. And if if we are in a, if we are in a sort of a place where sort of like cultural ghettos where the where the rich are so rich that they don't really need so if we analyze like online content and social media as um as like capitalism two point or whatever in terms of the consumer is the content creator and the producer um with none of the power. With none, well, yeah, I mean, in in that sub mm-hmm. process, um, they don't need that really anymore. I mean, it's still there, and it's, and they're developing security measures from from that. Um, the the, the big data and uh, biometric um, recognition. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, to my mind, without getting info wars on this, mm-hmm. is the preparation for the decoupling. Um, of the, the the that wedge of inequality, where say in in the pre-war period of capitalism, the early days of capitalism, and this is what without the degree of automation that we're, that are that's on our doorstep right now, um, society in inverted commas was something decoupled from that that working base, and no no offer of culture was there um, there was no communication there was no need for for that relationship and i think now that inequality has reached that um level again that that i i, I don't see the use in c- extending that cultural offer um and like i said there you know like facebook and facial recognition data is the big story at the moment that's that's what these things are that it'd be less of a culture thing so i suppose ultimately what i'm saying is that that cultural space opens up for something else and and i mean like if 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 the far right is already activating in that space um activating and mobilizing um nodes in that space Mm -hmm. i think we've said and touched on nodes but it's in hss um then it's it's a matter of I feel it's a matter of articulation and I do I do believe that people are tuning in to this more more and more um, evidenced by those like you don't you don't need you don't need to like the, the the popular movement necessary to get say Sanders into government which would have huge material impacts on everything we're speaking about right now isn't enormous. Trump got in without the popular vote. Um, it's so so we're not we're not talking about like t- a totalizing public and like I don't know I, I, I've never seen like she's like m- my difficulty with Muf is almost coming from the other side than yours. Like um, her her public is fully fractured, and the only way I can articulate it like Laclau seems to technically describe the sort of the processes and like I said the sinews of of the mediated um or the self-mediating not the self-mediating because 
once it mediates itself, it becomes something else, blah, blah, blah. Um, he's attempting to sort of put technical language to the, to the really complex and human um, descriptions that she's attempting to express in terms of like group, not group psychology, but group dynamics and, and um, the emphasis on plurality. Um, she's reaching them back to Laclau, I think, to try to articulate those processes that how those utterly diffuse and continuously fluctuating groups um, can associate with each other. And, and I think we had this in the last chat, Ali, that um, it's sort of maybe up to us to fill in the, uh, the blanks on how to actually put that into practice, I feel. Yeah, I think, I think that was... Abstract. Sorry. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, that was that was something that we we touched on. That I remember coming away from uh, HSS, and I guess, and in to to an extent as well, Fisher's uh, capitalist realism. Um, I mean, I think capitalist realism left me with more of a, a feeling of of dread because it kind of just like opened up all this stuff to me. Because again, this was I was quite new to a lot of uh, a lot of this kind of stuff, and especially Fisher's work in general. Um, it was, I got to a point, well, I guess it didn't leave me with it. it. It brought me to the brink of dread and then allowed me to kind of fall off into that contingency, into what what could be made possible um, and to conjure that up and to consider that and try to visualize those against, um, you know, my, <clears throat> even as we've said, like on, on, a, on in, a, in a communal way or maybe, sorry, uh, like a, uh, yeah, like a local way, but also trying to conceive of this on a much more grander scale. Uh, that, like you're alluding to, Stephen, like this idea of global um, muff. I, I, and and Laclau, I, I fell away from that feeling that, yeah, it's um, you know, I wasn't, I, well, perhaps maybe on like a, a small, like insignificant uh, level uh, psychologically. I was there was an element of me that was waiting for. Um, the, the needle to drop and to go, ah, so, you know, now we're there. And I was like, oh no, but you know, therein lies the, um, I guess how critical it is. Uh, my, I got to the end of the book and it didn't tell me how to do it. It just said, this is how serious this is. And, you know, here, here's the, here's the thesis on this, which, which I think is, you know, I think it goes that extra step. It's, it's, it's not merely a pointing out of inequalities, of how entrenched uh, neoliberalism has 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 become, to the point of it's it's almost it's an all-encompassing but invisible force. Um, it's not just a mere pointing out of those things. It's it's a it's a pointing out of um, where these things perhaps you know began once upon a time and where they fell, uh, or where they s slowly faded to more of an opaque uh, fracture uh, fractured status and where we could pick up from there again but again it's always about the imagining of these of these movements um but, uh, like, with, i think i think our problem now is not that there is no alternative but that there are too many alternatives like okay we have an endless like field of because we talk about contingency so much in fragmentation um that there are an endless array of ways for us to kind of vent our frustration vent our fear vent our kind of desire to change things i mean you know we're doing it right now on this podcast people are writing blogs people are you know putting together co-ops people are banning plastic straws people are doing all of these things like in all of these multiple various ways but again it these are like these like fine filaments against the might of a very material and very real uh, political, you know, economics infrastructure that is is very real, you know, um, <clears throat> like involving servers and you know five uh, G networks, and I don't mean that as in the conspiracy theory of five G networks, but just these you know infrastructures like. <laughs> um, that allow these very, very powerful networks to function and for power to circulate through them. And I think that 
the thing I guess I'm being pushing for here is more attention to the material basis of our, um, you know, proposed future or, you know, a more egalitarian, a more uh, uh, positive and, you know, uh, like, you know, the ideal for me is that people are able to, like, you know, everyone has the opportunity to just flourish, to be creative, to, you know, enjoy the natural world and to enjoy human relationships and the intrinsic value of living rather than being, you know, like living the kind Stressed. of lives that we live at the moment, which are just so pathetic and so petty and so, so washed out of meaning um, that, you know, like part of me thinks like, you know, you'd be better off living to the age of 30 um, and having a fucking savannah to run around and, you know, yeah, you, life expectancy and medical technologies aren't there, but like the life you have is like meaningful in and of itself. Um, but the instrumentalization of our lives is just so, you know, all encompassing that, that, you know, meaning and the intrinsic worth of living is, is, is non-existent and we can't spend time with the people we love. We have fleeting moments where we can do that. Even when we do, we're so fucked up because we're so used to technology. We can't communicate in person and children can't actually do that anymore. Psychologists are finding they're, they're unable to be by themselves. They're unable to have relationships with other people. All they can do is have these online digital encounters. <clears throat> Sorry, all of that's to say um, that uh, we need to pay more attention to the kind of like political, economic and material basis upon which we can uh, both, you know, imagine and build these futures. So we need, we need power. Well, how, how close would you, you know? Um, mm. Do you want to add? No, no, that's fine. How close, and there's two answers to this, mm -hmm. how close was the UK coming to a Corbyn government that would have like begun democratising the economy? Now, pretty close in terms that it existed and that there, there was a successful, to a point, appeal to that long-standing um, discourse on democracy and obviously a million miles away because because the power that you're talking about enacts itself in a way to just sort of make sure that that appeal doesn't um doesn't come to bear on on the status quo but the fact that um the what was it ollie the rights of man the french revolution that democratic document that was mentioned in the book that that I mean that that came out of nowhere, well I mean, with the Enlightenment, but mm -hmm. and and its its appeal still resonates strongly today. And the the sort of the sub the sub point the point one one point two mm -hmm. here is that oh well your parliamentary democracy isn't democratic is the next logical thing to articulate in that. Um, oh. The, the material the material uh, power will come to bear then in in arguing that it isn't but but already already Johnson questioned for a technically democratic um, emphasis uh, already questioned the, the the parliamentary mechanism in the UK in in September um, that yeah but like these fluctuations whether it's Corbyn or Sanders or Trump or Hillary or Johnson, like these are fluctuations on a like you know within a band that the market can. Wait, how how far are the how far is that trend going? Which trend? The the one with your fluctuations. I suppose it's the beginning of market capitalism. Okay, you know, like you've got this kind of like once market capitalism gets up and running and it starts becoming the all-consuming beast that it yeah, yeah. colonizes more and more areas of social life uh, to become the capitalist realism that it is now that it literally is the source of all reality and uh you know we can't understand the world without it even that we can but that's you know the conventional understanding is that right now like it's the market you know the, the market is the ontology the market is the reality through which you know all decision making is made it's the ultimate you know even the 
even the tech giants, even the billionaires, they're beholden to the market. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the, the, the source of everything. Um, and it's about how do we get beyond that? You know, how can we, you know, build up enough resources that we can tip that, that kind of those fluctuations within the kind of mean that the, the market can perfectly, you know, repair itself and continue to function to the point that that goes absolutely wild and it just fucking disintegrates and falls apart. I, I wouldn't see without it. killing half the planet because <laughs> you know climate change will do that and it'll tip it. But uh, oh, we yeah. don't want that to happen. We, you know, a third a third world, world war will do that. So and, like World War Two did that, but it like balanced itself out again. You know, and it like it corrected itself. And when it did that, we had social democracy. You know, but it just came back to itself. I mean, like currently, I think the the two imminent issues is the the fallout of neoliberalism and the rise of the far right, and I do think that they're separate from that trend. So, not not personally being a fan of capitalism, um, I suppose what we're treating right now is an like within. It's um it's not necessarily critical of capitalism. Um it can be, but I don't think it is. Um or I don't think they are. I think Muf Black Lion Mufer are talking about a, a, a rearticulation of the market. And the rearticulation of the market that happened with Thatcher and Reagan is their specific um target. And I think that once that articulation comes under threat, obviously since 2008, 2013 being the, the scorpion tail of 2008, where it comes to bear on people's lives um, in a far more general sense, and people are beginning to question um, their, that, that paradigm at that point only, um, you're getting, you're getting a, a new interpretation on those things. And... Um, Everything, everything in that sequence is is interpretations, is, is articulations of the same set of um, equality and liberty, um, and the market. The market doesn't have to be. So I, th I, I agree. Like the, but uh, the I identify the pervasiveness of market logic as neoliberal rather than capital, um, and but on the other side of that, I don't. I don't um, identify market as being mutually exclusively capitalist either, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 it comes in and out conceptually there, but it's toward the forces in neoliberalism. I think mm -hmm. um, that's the logic that's sort of really impinged on our actions, the way you're sort of talking about, like our, our ability, not ours, in a grassroots sense, but society, humanity's ability to uh, to deal with something like climate change. Um, to sign that off, um, but but yeah, but we're already seeing a, a new interpretation on that, um, or the possibility of of discussing an, another um, interpretation. I mean, the more yeah, sorry, Ali. Um, yeah, I mean, climate change is one thing that I hold out hope for, not that climate change will happen and destroy the market. And the majority of the people on the planet are from billionaires or whatever. Rich. Um, what I hope is that climate change can upset things enough that people do act outside of that, act outside of the kind of, because you know, like Western society and its reverberations through the rest of the, the world is built on the foundational principles of the market. And, you know, society functions, like the, the questions and the answers that are posed globally are posed and answered by the market. Um, questions of, you know, peace, war, um, like sovereignty, everything is dictated by uh, the the logic of the market. Um, and if we can find a way of founding some sort of new collective 
principles, um, climate change might be the leverage um, that we need to enable to happen. Like at the moment, the climate change discourse is so poor. It's like, you know, it's very weak. It's it's just about moved on from, you know, individuals need to like turn off their lights and recycle to a more collective sense, thanks in part to the likes of Greta Thunberg, but it's still very weak because it's it's within, you know, like supermarkets and, um, you know, like Plastics renewable, like energy companies, like, you know, it's still within uh, a, a market logic that it's like, okay, we carbon can, trading. Yeah, we can, we can figure this out like this. But even the likes of like, and one thing that Black Lion Wolf are good at doing is that like this absolute beholden to Marx and like as if communism is the only alternative we could ever imagine to the market. It's like, okay, so maybe communism isn't the the answer, particularly now that this so many things have changed since the uh since Marx's idea and theories of capital. Um like so much stuff has changed. It's like okay, let's think of something else, <laughs> you know? And it's like the amount of like funding and research that goes into everything that we know about um, and how little research goes into what about a better way of running the world, you know? And it's probably the number one question. Um, yeah, I think I think on the back of what Stephen was saying. Yeah, I, I agree, absolutely. Even though um, Greta is someone who, even though she came here, actually, she she was in Madrid. Oh, yeah. um, here I, <laughs> right next, yeah, she, she didn't want to be in the video though, unfortunately. <laughs> um, uh, I agree. I think it was really quite, uh, I think the word I would use is invigorating. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing someone um, outspoken, uh, I think definitely starting to draw a light or at least start to point one in, in the direction of, I think, Ed, you said earlier on, um, it, it towards perhaps the systemic uh, causes of these things, as well as pointing, you know, we're pointing fingers at politicians, but we're also pointing fingers at industry. Um, indirectly, then we're pointing fingers at capital and market and, you know, in, in which ways uh, has climate change and you know the consistent uh, bulldozing of our own our own environmental space um, been impacted on? Not necessarily just because you know you didn't you had your TV on standby all night. It was it was mainly you know how are people also able to pay to pollute the air of countries <laughs> that they're not in? Mm -hmm. um, and you know I had a. a conversation with someone the other day similarly about these things saying they were arguing over what I, I don't know millennials zillennials and boomers and i think oh, hang on, on a second is zillennials a thing i said I that to so. myself today i must have picked it up by osmosis it's like yeah. ah, someone should say zillennials <laughs> um yeah i think generation z is that a thing yeah that's it right it is, i yeah. think that's where it yeah. stems from so yeah and i, I just thought uh, that's ridiculous but yeah <laughs> Carry on. Um, away, uh, uh, com compared to the rest, compared to the word boomer or <laughs> or I millennial, um, and you know the I, yeah. But the, the the simple point that I had was like, yeah, we can we can all sit around and argue about who's who's been the worst, mm -hmm. or you know we could we could you know pay more attention to the systemic faults that are in practice here, um, and and that was just around a bar table. Uh, but yeah, so I do believe things like you know. Greta's uh, Greta's work um, has has been great, could be great, continues to be great at pointing out that stuff. Um, and I, you know, I look at then things like the push with Corbyn, the push with Sanders, especially I, I guess because maybe Corbyn's, you know, the what happened with the UK and Corbyn is something that I, I guess I have a bit more of a personal stake in, so to speak. Um, one thing that I'm consistently frustrated by is how many people I know who voted in 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 the way of labor um and now that it didn't sort of you know we haven't passed into Corbynism uh which I don't think half of them would have wanted anyway because I think they were it was more of a a, a a punch against the Tories um they uh they're all now swaying away from that 
and saying, yeah, well, we wouldn't have gotten, like, it wasn't going to work out anyway. So they'll probably just kind of lapse back into voting Lib Dem. Um, what I kind of see as what I, the positive I try to take from with everything that happened around um, the rise of Corbyn and, and, and the turnout that there was for that, regardless of if those people fully aligned with Corbyn, is that, you know, that was a huge turnout. It did, I think, put ideas into the fore that hadn't been talked about, especially by, you know, my generation specifically for a very long time. And I would say that the best thing we could do is completely top load that and continue to not, not, not fall away from it, not see it as a failure, but see it as a progression. Um, and specifically, you know, starting to get into, I think Ed, you said this right at the beginning, uh, not to, not to outline Brexit as say a left or right wing, uh, move, uh, move uh, even though it was it was mobilized uh, in in as, in as such, uh, I was fascinated to be pointed in the direction of people considering Brexit. You know why leaving the by leaving the European Union could also be a left wing movement based on based on a series of of, of criteria, and that was fascinating to me. Is this um, only just happening? Because that's disappointing. Pardon? Go on. Sorry. I mean. Um, um, but that was absolutely captivating. Um, and if anything, it aligns, I feel with what we've talked about with Muff and Leclerc, this idea that, you know, absolutely. I, I think that the way that some of my friends on the, you know, who would, who would align with left-wing politics have criticized people who, um, wanted to leave Europe um, they've criticized them in ways that I feel is actually quite nasty uh, and does not characterize them in, in, in a light that I feel is particularly progressive, yeah. uh, nor is it useful uh, for a left, an inclusive left movement, a wider uh, spectrum left. Um, but so that's, that's, you know, I guess that's kind of part of my, my praxis on that is like, you know, to top load this stuff, not to see it as a failure, but to see it as uh, a movement forward. Um, and hopefully that would also then, you know, it, it, that starts to push these ideas maybe more into the public, Stephen, regarding some of the stuff, the, the economic and the political situation that we find ourselves in now that you were referring to. Again, things like, you know, Greta referring, you know, pointing fingers. Um, we've spoken about it in the past, Ed, where, you know, again, I think it's, it's great. I think what she does is brilliant. Um, what I would also like to see, and this is not a, an in any way, shape, or form, me saying this is how you do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, hold hold my beer while I figure out climate change. But it was a sort of more, um, you know, a case of okay, well, the next step from the celebrity factor of this now, which is obviously very useful. Um, don't, but don't go over, don't go towards Oprah, and and certainly don't go, don't go over there. Just come back and perhaps start working with back to school so you can leave school again. And it's not meant in the it's not meant in that in that sort of, you know, I, I know I that like some some someone in the economist I think had a go at her, didn't they? And they said something along the lines of you should go and study economics because you don't understand no, how he was the from markets the, work. Or, he was from the Trump that, administration. Oh, was it from the Trump administration? Sorry, I I couldn't I remember the exact by his wife. <laughs> Um, but I mean, I definitely think there's something to be said about, say, going back, investing, you know, once you've got this, this attention, go back, invest your time in, in where you can be involved directly in, in some of these, some of these ideas that she, you know, she clearly has and has finally got the stage. Um, and that could be working in a grassroots way, but maybe in a more, you know, perhaps scholaristic, maybe, uh, you know foundational way in that sense through through you know it's, yeah. a, it, it's a struggle yeah. i mean it's a struggle it's called a struggle because it's a struggle and i think <laughs> i think what you're describing definitely is the 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 sort of this the tiles at the at the fringes <laughs> turning and flipping off and i'm like i'm looking at a bit from um capitalist realism here um i don't know is this a paraphrase or a quote or whatever but they're talking about like um let me see is it worth reading um yeah yeah the um so on the one hand in our system there's a an official ideological line of corporate responsibility and social concern but on the other hand a really existing um general knowledge this is false and in in our actual professional um 
daily discourse that that's never really breached and like coming into meetings um again in the third sector where where we're we're we're, we're focusing on an issue or someone is focusing on an issue that the focus of the meeting is on an issue and it's being spoke about without regard for um turning back any of the incidences and circumstances that have brought that issue into being so it's just an amelioration um and i mean they're they're either like some weird automatons i say that right or they're thinking fucking what a load of bullshit we're just piling on to the issue another set of issues and we're continuously building this fucking pile of shit instead of why the hell aren't we directing these resources to dealing with the the underlying circumstances and that's you know that's like fisher's the big other the real um um and his suggestion and, and and like this this introduction to the aspect of the chat is is leveled just at that um that uh that that aspect but his suggestion as well as Lackland and Moose, is to um is for that to be acknowledged. And he's arguing that once once that connect is made, once those conversations are had in those situations, and well probably beyond the third sector, and, and this directly relates to where these conversations need to be had at actual p- levels of power um that can come to bear in terms of climate change. But it's when the conversation turns to oh we all know this is bullshit let's actually talk about it but the problem is that there are big others and capital realisms and for different groups and different sectors in different countries in the world these manifest themselves in very very different ways Um, is that not the importance of acting locally and and are people on the fringes not starting to have those conversations but they always have been on the fringes Okay, so actually, this is a point that Lacla I wanted to bring us up earlier. This is a point that Lacla brought up uh, in in the in the lead up to the French Revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the the point that you're talking about that um, these things are diffuse mm-hmm. and uh, not really coming to bear. Mm-hmm. The, there was con- continuous, um, like a continual. What the fuck's the word? Continual re- rebellions were were constantly like flaring up in, yeah. in, in, in towns. And it was only once a sort of, um, a very, only once a certain configuration of them mm-hmm. occurred at the same time that they were able to identify one another mm-hmm. and they, they formed into a, a movement that was able to um, take down the, mm-hmm. the aristocracy. And um, so we can either be, stagist here and say that well we can wait for that to happen or we can be political and say that we can sort of work but the scale like look at the ussr and its attempt to act globally you know and its work in south america its work in indonesia and the us's uh and the middle east and the us's uh counter counter work that was done like you know that was done with the resources of those uh, political economic juggernauts. You know, when you're talking about the shifting of the aristocracy in France, like the scale is so different. And I think that one of the issues is that the scale now is definitely global um, for a lot of the issues, whether you're talking about like billionaires, tech companies, uh, states, militaries, whatever it is. Um, but the consciousness is still so dispersed and so fragmented um, that we need to not only sort of draw together um, like ideas and like, you know, <clears throat> like a cultural sense of belonging and identity and representations. We need to bring like material weight behind this. Um, resources like power to institutions networks and to use that type of thing um i think when i start seeing that happening i'll be encouraged what what about being part of something that attempts to make that happen 
yeah okay <laughs> um <laughs> yeah of course but hmm. you know like if if i had an idea you had an idea someone i knew had an idea that i could see that i'd be like holy shit you know um yeah yeah <sighs> Like, I'm sure Momentum feel that in the UK. Mm. But, but I mean, how about, how about, um, like, how about brokering uh, a, um, an explicit official partnership between Momentum? Oh, are we still? We're not. You're good. Can you hear I can us? Hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? I just punched the little um, circuit board. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Can you hear? Yeah. Oh, fuck's sake, it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit that bit out. Yeah. <laughs> Into the... okay. He's sabotaging yeah, okay, the material now. infrastructure. Yeah. Fuck, what was I saying? Um, oh yeah, yeah. Make an explicit, um, yeah. an explicit partnership between Momentum Unite and uh, Extinction Rebellion. Mm-hmm. I was going to say Extinction of Mankind, um, <laughs> which is a band, uh, not the vacuous statement. Mm-hmm. Um, that's 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 a resource, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I mean, I don't think I definitely think we're going to be. M- focusing more on the practical um if you can leverage the family <laughs> if you can leverage the power behind Here comes the ideas people's <laughs> effective like sense of sacrifice and sense of like they will do anything if you can leverage the family <laughs> you're deaf then of the interest but i mean like I, 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 I the would... investment people have in the idea of the family i want to get into that mm-hmm. But I think we should wrap this up, yeah. and I and I think we will get in into the more of those ideas. But I don't think mm-hmm. we will necessarily next time. I mean, I'm sure we will, but not as a focus, uh, because that'll be the uh, universal subject. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I suppose that does explicitly talk about binding people together. Yeah. So I mean, I guess. I suppose what I'm saying there was it more more the material praxis um, will come after that um, oh. because what well, is I think um, did I say it at the start that this this will be sort of this period will be the who and then we'll get to uh, who in terms of uh, the universal <laughs> subject then we'll get to how in terms of how do we draw them together mm. and. And not like we will, but like how does that happen? And then um and then finally what in terms of what do they what should we import? Mm-hmm. Uh yeah, so let's wrap that up.